Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this month's CT Day webinar. We've developed this program to help deliver education to the tile industry. CTDA would also like to thank our 2021 webinar sponsor, MaPay. We are using a new platform, Remo, that you'll hopefully promote networking with each other. We're now in presentation mode, so you won't be able to access the previous floor pen page and network via video, but you will be able to chat with each other as well as ask questions during the presentation. The audio for today's event will be broadcast through your computer speakers. Be sure that they are turned on and the volume is turned up. All participants are now muted. This will help us better hear and understand the presentation. If at any time you would like to ask a question, please use the question feature located on your screen. At the end of the presentation, I'll read any questions that are not answered during the webinar. And at that time, you'll be able to enter more questions into the question feature, and all participants will remain on mute. When the presentation and Q&A is complete, we will go back into networking mode where you can move from table to table to network with each other. Lastly, I want to let you know that this webinar will be recorded and emailed to you as well and posted on the CTDA website for member access in the future. Today's webinar, TCNA and ANSI Specifying Successful Tile and Stone Systems, will be presented by Jim Whitfield, the Director of Technical Services at MAPE. Jim manages a strong technical services department that provides support for MAPE's many products, with floor covering installation systems and tile and stone installation systems. He's actively involved in the development of the the tile industry standards on TCNA, ANSI, and ISO committees. Jim is also on the NTCA Technical Committee and the current president of the MMSA Materials Method, Methods and Standards Association. In addition, the Construction Specification Institute honored Jim for his contributions to education in the construction industry with a fellowship in 2001. So without further ado, I'm going to pass the controls over to Jim to present to you the TCNA and ANSI specifying successful tile and stone systems. Thank you, Trish. Mm -hmm. All right. Are you able to see that? If I can see the presentation so now. You can see it? Yep, I can see it. Good. Ooh. There you go. All right, cool. Excellent. Well, good morning, good afternoon to some of you. Um, thank you for joining us today. I hope to demystify or make using the TCNA and ANSI handbook a little bit easier, a um, little bit better comprehension. Um, I think they're daunting uh, books in, in that TCNA, you know, back in 2000 was probably uh, a, a, a half inch at most thick, and now it's up in an inch and a half, inch and three quarters thick. Uh, it, it's quite a bit of additional information, and I know it can be confusing or or, or difficult to look to find things in there. So I hope to give you a lot of uh, good points on, on how to get there and how to find things, coordination between the two documents and really how they, they really put together and, and, and give you a little bit of a background on what it takes to get methods and so on into the handbooks. So um, we'll review the industry standards, TCNA, Tile Council of North America Handbook, and ANSI, American National Standards Institute, uh, the coordination between the documents, the two documents together. Uh, how to understand the tile setting materials and application methods in the TCNA. Learn the standards, how they change, the frequency that these documents get changed, and why these changes benefit your project specification. And how do you use TCNA and ANSI to improve the quality of the next tile project? First, I always like to start off with some basic uh, explanations of our, our tile systems, if you might. Uh, and, and commonly, we've got a concrete substrate, uh, and then a slope mortar bed, and that's slope so that water that it gets on it and the waterproof membrane on top of it go directly into the drain. Then the mortar bed itself, an adhesive, in our case, thin set in most cases, and a sanded grout or non-sanded for that matter. Could be epoxy, could be single component these days. Thin set. The most common method used today 
and basic, I hate to say basic thin sets. That's really not the right way to put it. But uh, a thin set material that's not an LHT, and I'll explain LHT in the next slide, is, is really to be used uh, notched out. And the notch gives us a consistency of gauge, if you might, uh, consistent thickness of material. And then, of course, we apply the tile to that notch and, and beat it in. That should be applied 330 seconds minimum after it's been beat in to as thick as one quarter inch. LHT, in this part of this presentation, the reason I kind of like to get this brought up is what we used to call a medium bed mortar. Today, it's called a large and heavy tile mortar. Um, this is a change and it's a change within the standards as well. It is, if, if, if they pass the standards, they'll achieve an H designation. I'll get into more on that and, and mortar designations deeper into the book, into the presentation. Um, it allows for thick set attributes. So you notch it out, much thicker uh, notch, could be three quarter inch notch by three quarter. You lay the tile into it. Better example of that might be a, uh, an ungauged slate. So you've got an 18 by 18 inch ungauged slate that might be three eighths of an inch at one end, in thickness and three quarters of an inch at the other. Well, the idea behind these medium beds is that you could basically float that off and then set it into the thin set and beat it in and still keep it reasonably level. So large format tiles are highly recommended, not required, but highly recommended for tiles greater than 15 inches in size and heavy tiles. So if you had a very uh, uh, heavy stone, as an example, it would make more sense to use an LHT mortar than a basic or everyday thin set. As I said, the LHT mortars will be designated with an H uh, when they pass the proper testing within the ANSI 118.1, 118.4, and 11815 uh, mortars. And then there's mud beds. So in the tile industry, we basically used to always make our own substrate. We would float it out on the walls like you see here being done in the tunnel in New York, or for that matter, uh, on, on floors. And, as you see being floated out on this floor over wire lath and paper. So this is an unbonded mortar bed. That's why the wire lath and the papers underneath it to isolate it from the slab itself. Uh, but mortar beds can be called thick set, thick bed, mud beds. You hear a variety of different things. But year, many years ago, we used to basically provide our own substrate. And that was part of the tile installation, if you might. Today with cement board and uh, there's really quite a, a variety of other additional boards that can be used on walls as well as floors. And in most cases provide some of the same structure, not necessarily the same look, uh, but, but really provide a good bondable surface. I'm going to start off with ISO standards. And, and the reason for that is I think it helps set up for some of the changes that have occurred in ANSI. So ISO is an international standards Institute, and they have standards as well for uh, setting materials, grouts, etc. Ceramic tile, matter of fact. And we're typically at 30, uh, 1306. But in the ISO standards, um, and they've also been added to the TCNA handbook. They're added back in 2011. So just to provide another level of detail, one of the big things that ISO did years ago is they created what I call designations. So in the case of thin sets, there is a one type of thin set that's cementitious. And then it is a either number C1, normal, C2, improved. So our higher end thin sets typically are C2. In addition to that in thin sets, they've got different attributes. Um, F for fast setting, T for slip resistance, or thixotropic, E for extended open time, so it'll stay open and fresh longer. Um, S1 for deformable or has some flexibility to it. S2, highly deformable, P1 for plywood adhesion, and P2 for improved plywood adhesion. And of course, there's all kinds of test standards set up to achieve those different de designations in the 1307 uh, ISO books. The dispersion, or what we call mastics, again, there's a D1 for normal, D2 for improved, and again, some different attributes might be accelerated drying, so it's, it dries fast, an A attribute, uh, a designation for accelerated drying. Or T for non-slip, again, thixotropic, or E for extended open time. So you can have a mastic that is improved and is very slip resistant. So it'd be a D2T. Hope that makes sense. 
Um, then there's reaction resins. Most common one that we have been used here in the U.S. is uh, epoxies, epoxy grouts, epoxy mortars, um, and furans and so on would fit in the same category, as well as urethanes. Uh, we personally have a, a urethane adhesive that we use in difficult to bond circumstances like stainless steel or elevator floors and things like that. Um, and it's a urethane adhesive. So you have a R1 or R2 for improved and then a T rating for slip resistance. And that's the mortars. Grouts set up similarly. Um, you've got a CG for cementitious grouts and then a, a CG1. Or CG2 might be like our 118.6 and a 118.7. And then for the grouts, they also have different attributes. F for fast setting, A for high abrasion resistance, and W for reduced water absorption. So our cementitious um, 118.7 uh, improved cementitious grouts it would be similar to a CG2 um, W. So it has half the water absorption that regular 118.6 does. Reaction resin grouts, again, epoxy grouts, um, and probably some of the premix ones today might qualify for this as well, is high performance characteristics with improved, improved over cementitious grouts. And that's basically it at this point. And in our case, we show the designations on our packaging as well as data sheets. So if you saw it called out an ANSI standard, you want something specific to that. Let's say you're doing a gauge porcelain tile. You wanted one that had extended open time and uh, non-slip characteristics. Uh, 118.15 uh, ET would make a lot of sense. And just look for that on the packaging or our data sheets. All right, let's talk about TCNA ANSI handbooks. Tile Council of North America, basically at this point, is one book, and it's for ceramic tile, glass, and stone. Uh, ANSI, at that, for that matter, has a variety of different books. The specifications for ceramic tile, 137.1, 2, and 3. Uh, specification for glass tile. Uh, specifications for installation of ceramic tile. Specification for installation materials, and that's the... Uh, test results, if you might, the 118.4s and so on. How do you achieve 118.4 versus 118.15? And specifications for gauge porcelain tile panels and slabs and installation of those same materials, interior as well as exterior. So the way I like to talk about the coordination of the two documents is TCNA is kind of like the drawings. It's got the pretty drawings. It gives you a CAD detail in the upper left-hand corner on how the layering of that system would look. And it's kind of a, a, a simpler way of looking at it and, you know, looking at the layers and, and figure out how to build that assembly. ANSI, for that matter, really is more like the specifications on a project. So if, if, if you're used to bidding commercial projects, you've got a set of plans, right? Drawings, TCNA, and you've got a spec book or a project manual, ANSI. In ANSI, they've got environmental requirements, weather as an example, temperatures. They've got the amount of coverage that you might need to make sure that the adhesive can bond well, um, a variety of different things, which we'll get into a little bit more details. But between the two, there's an excellent balance. In TCNA methods, I will show you later in the presentation, it actually references ANSI as well as ISO standards. So they really work well together. And to, uh, in my opinion, it's, what's important is coordination between the two. Now, TCA and ANSI, what are they? Um, they are voluntary standards. They are not like the building code, which is adopted by the legislature or the government for that matter. They're voluntary. There are no compliance requirements. However, they are our best practices. And unfortunately, if something was to occur on one of your projects and it was negative and it was not installed correctly, the odds are very, very good that these books are going to go into court with you because they're considered to be the proper way to do it, considered to be the best practices for the industry, and so on. But again, it's not a legal requirement. It is a best practice and highly, highly recommended. T 
TCNA, ANSI, and ISO standards. How are they developed? Well, okay, so we put, in some cases, as many as 65 people in a room, and we try to agree on something. That is industry consensus and open committees. When I say industry consensus, that group's made up of, and this is true of almost all of the groups, TCNA, ANSI, and ISO, um, it's made up of manufacturers like ourselves or tile manufacturers. Um, it's made up of allied manufacturers. Might be somebody who just makes, uh, what would be a good example, um, tools for gauge porcelain tile or something like that, uh, as well as users. So users might be the American Institute of Architects, right? They, are, they heavily use our industry, industry standards. Users can be labor. Labor is everything from the union to uh, members of National Tile Contractors Association and so on. Um, there's cons industry standards consultants too, like American Plywood Association, Association has a seat typically in ANSI and, and TCNA. Um, steel stud manufacturers and so on. So it's really kind of a consensus of the industry to try to keep a good balance between labor, manufacturers, and users. Well, I should say, and also some consultants. And it's open. So you have to apply for it, but anybody could apply for the committees if, if they had interest. Now, it doesn't quite look like this in the meetings, but I will tell you that it can be very heated sometimes trying to come to an agreement. Not to mention, you know, in some cases we get together twice a year. And so to get a standard pass through can take anywhere from 18 months to I've seen 10, 12 years, uh, depending on the complexity of the standard. And the interest of the committee to try and get it passed as well, to be honest with you. So... It takes time to get a standard through. We, we try to resolve any negatives, and so the standard moves forward with, with all support. Um, it can take many years. Handbook. So the handbooks, really, we meet twice a year. I'm, I'm sorry, every two years, not twice a year. And that's when most of the changes are made. However, you, we can make changes every year. If there's something important that we feel that needs to be changed today in, in the digital world, um, we can actually go out for a vote at any time and make a change that if the next publish, publish date, it can get incorporated into it. Um, it has similar rules to ANSI in that it's consensus, it's an open committee, and so on. Um, it's been published annually for well over 50 years. 2011 brought some major renovation to the TCNA handbook. And again, before that, it was only ceramic tile and ceramic tile methods. Then we added glass, glass mosaics, and so on. And we also added stone, dimensional stone or stone tiles, uh, all into one industry resource. So it tripled in size. In the front of the TCNA handbook, and I will say close to the very, right, right behind the, table of contents, I believe, which is in the very front, is these two pages you see on the outside. And, and those are technical changes to the 2021 TCNA handbook. Now, I will tell you that, I know you can't see this probably, it's, it's, it's too fine a print for, for presentation, but most of them are just revisions, minor revisions to things that are written. Could be a correction of language or, or goodness. Um, there's a, every year we try to take a real good look at things and or for that matter, it requires updating because sustainability standards have changed and that section needs to be updated as an example. Um, there are some added areas and that's what, this year there's really three areas that were added. Um, there were sections in the ceramic tile selection guide and the glass tile selection guide uh, were updated and added uh, information for surface wear resistance and dynamic, dynamic coefficient of friction. So the, in addition to that, one thing that was added in is at the end of the, the page on the right side, hand side is the um, movement joint section. Um, we added a new drawing for EJ171M for non-linear movement joints. And what does that mean? Well, 
we always think of movement joints as a straight line, right? Because typically we're trying to come out of a control joint or out of a true movement joint in a building. And those are straight. But in the case of tile, a lot of cases, if we have a good manufacturer proves a, a, a cracked isolation membrane down, you might be able to stagger around that movement area. In other words, the reason for moving a control joint up through the top is because a control joint's there for one reason, and that's that if there's shrinkage in the concrete and there's a crack that needs to occur, it should occur in the control joint because it's a weaker plane. In other words, it's recessed, so it's not as thick of a slab as a slab around it. And so if it wants to shrink or crack, it should crack right there. Having a soft joint of sealant and backer rod instead of a grout joint in those areas helps for a couple reasons. One, it allows for the tile, which is as small as it'll ever be when it comes out of the kiln. In other words, as it gets wet, it's a clay product. It can expand some. As well as if that crack was to occur underneath it, the soft joints, if properly installed, should allow for that to not carry through to the surface. And so we've never had details before for non-linear movement joints, um, but we do now in the handbook. And that's, what, that's what's uh, one of the changes that occurred this, this last year. So, uh, and that's highlighted in these two documents, uh, as I said, are on the left and the right side. In the middle is the actual page of that change. Um, that's actually the page of that change when we took it to the handbook committee and the handbook committee looked at it. So that's why you see the highlights in red and so on, because those were for those are changes that need to be under consideration. And were adopted, by the way, of course. I know the size of the TCNA handbook can be intimidating, but it really shouldn't be. It's a very, very valuable resource to tile contractors, um, as well as design professionals and owners for that matter. Really what's probably the most appropriate thing in the TCNA handbook or what, what people look to most is the details of the CAD details that you see an example of that is 113A uh, on the right. So that's an above ground structural slab and the way these are set up is, well, and I'll get into more detail on the CAD detail in a second, but really the easiest way to think about these different methods, F113, F is for floors. If a method starts like uh, W240, uh, that's a wall method. B or SR for steam room, um, bathtubs, showers, and steam rooms. C is for ceilings or countertops. Okay, that could be confusing, right? Um, and P for pools or water features, wet areas, submerged areas. So then after that, so you typically have F113A, dash 21 for this year. So the 2021 TCNA handbook is F113A-21. Some methods may look redundant, and this is a great example. F113 is another method in the handbook. This one, F113A, is for above grade. Why do we have two CAD details and, and, and information on F113? Because above grade requires more movement joints. So it's a little bit different installation than regular 113. In the front of the book, there's a variety of different excellent guides and important resources. And there's the product selection guides. So, you know, it lists out all the different types of mortars and how you might select through those, what might be the best or most appropriate one for your project. Field and installation requirements. And this is where it gets into um, frequency of movement joint. No, not really so much. It does, but not in a lot of detail. It gets into uh, a variety of different things that you should look for in the field ahead of time. Um, and again, there's a variety of different ones that we'll, we'll, we'll I'll show you some more in them as we get a little bit deeper into it. One of the other things is environmental exposure classifications. I'll show you a slide on that. Ceramic and glass tile installation methods. Those are two different sections, ceramic and ceramic tile installation methods, as well as glass tile methods. And stone is again, a separate one beyond that. So the TCNA, it, Tile initiative, which you see a picture of on the right. And in the tile initiative, we've got a variety of different things from sustainability information to DCOF information, um, dynamic coefficient of friction, uh, slip resistance information. Uh, so there's a variety of different things in the tile initiative. And I think I've got a slide on that as well. But 
at the end of the book is EJ171, and that's the movement joint inflammation. Some resources in the back, um, and I really find some of the stuff in the back to be some of the most important information. An overview of I ISO 1307, uh, the standards for ceramic tile adhesives as well as grout. In each TCNA method, there is a estimated weight of that assembly. In the back of the book, it, under, it explains what they used for estimating the weight of the assembly. In other words, if you've got an installation that has a mortar bed, a thin set mortar, tile, and etc., then they're going to tell you how much they figured for the weight of the mortar bed versus the setting material. The test methods are referenced as well in the very back. And then there's a method locator by application. In my opinion, the table of contents. The easiest way to find a method, uh, if you might, is to look it up by the application. So you could look at floors, plywood, if you had a plywood floor that you're using. Look it up there and it'll direct you to the method and the page number and so on in the front of the book. Really a valuable resource. The installation guides, as I said earlier, there's a ceramic tile, porcelain, and glass tile one for installation. And stone is the next section. So the methods by application, floors, interior, as well as exterior, start with an F. Walls, interior and exterior, start with a W, like again, W211. Ceilings and soffits, C13, C315. Um, bathtub showers and receptors, B421. Countertops, C512, pools, P601. These are just examples of what, what they might look like. Um, radiant heat, RH116. Uh, renovation, um, tile renovation. So it could be tile over tile, a few different scenarios in that section. Um, TR712 is one of those methods. Refrigerated rooms, Founds, steam rooms, SR614, and movement joints, EJ, expansion joint, 171. And I kind of break this down as an anatomy, if you might, of a TCNA method. And what I mean by that is all of the, the, the methods within the handbook, I'm going to point her here, um, have a CAD detail. So as I said, this is a pretty simple one, but it shows you the different layering of the, of the system. We've got a concrete subfloor. There may be a, a membrane, but it's not required. It's optional. A cementitious adhesive and ceramic tile. Pretty simple. That is basically thin set tile to a concrete slab or could have a membrane involved. But all the methods are set up in the same way in that they have recommended uses where that installation or method should be used. Service ratings, we'll get into more details on service ratings, but in this case, Con uh, ceramic tile, thin set direct to concrete, extra heavy use, uh, environmental exposure classifications, the typical weight of the system, about five pounds per square foot, the limitations of this type of method, some of the different membrane options, and you've got everything in here from crack isolation to waterproofing to uh, maybe uncoupling, requirements, and materials. So you'll notice here all the ceramic tile and all the other methods, they list ANSO, ANSI, as well as ISO standards right there. So, you know, if you've got an installation going above ground, you're probably looking at in an area where you're anticipating deflection, an ANSI 118.15 or an ISO uh, C2 uh, S2, you know, for movement. So, Preparation by other trades. Let's face it, we're only setting tile. We're not putting the concrete slab in typically. That would be uncommon. Um, so it's got some requirements for them. Movement joints. Yes, they're required, whether you like it or not. Uh, installation specifications. And some notes. These notes are pretty specific just to that detail. In other words, just to this method, not to other ones within the book. And last, materials for green sustainability and design. So almost every method in there, regardless of what it's built on, whether it's a steam room, a pool, or a, uh, a, a basic installation, have these same categories within them. All right, now we're going to talk a little bit about service ratings. And I say that because this is, a, to me, a valuable part of the book, but it could be confusing. Most people don't typically understand that, understand it, but the service ratings are based on the ASTM test 6 
ASTM method C627, or the Robinson floor testing machine. What does that mean? Well, that this is a traditional Robinson floor testing machine, as you see here. Comes up out of the center of the, the Robinson pad. Weights are added to it. They rotate. Um, for the most part, really, it's been unchanged since 1970. We made a revision oh, three years ago, two to three years ago, I was involved with. Uh, it's a very, very common measuring stick for how a floor is to perform. Um, as was mentioned, the C21.06 committee just recently revised this, and I was part of that, that whole thing. Um, so keep in mind what Robinson does. If I had that same method that we showed you at with, with earlier, um, this method here, and that's concrete with ceramic tile thin set directly to the concrete. But now, as a manufacturer, I want to carry a five millimeter or 10 millimeter um, quarter inch or, or, or thicker recycled rubber sound reduction membrane. How's that going to affect the extra, ready, extra heavy rating I receive for that thin set tile direct to the concrete slab? So we will rebuild the assembly in a four foot by four foot pad and put it into this machine, the Robinson, with the 10 millimeter, or I'll use, say, I'll use five millimeter recycled rubber membrane. Um, and now run the same amount of testing. Now I'll get into the amount of rotations and so on in a second. But, and then see if it still holds up as well. That's really what this comes down to. In the picture on the right, you see a long assembly. Now this is not common to the Robinson test, but we did it here at our facility years and years ago. I'll, I mean, I would tell you this is eight to 10 years old. We built a joist system um, with plywood and plywood on top and then installed a thin gauge porcelain tile. So we wanted to see with the amount of pressure applied here, if it started to affect the assembly with span as well and deflection from the wood, wood substrate. So this is an uncommon use of the Robinson. Um, but the next pictures will probably be a better example, but uh, we don't have our machine set up like this by any means at, at all the time, but we have the ability to. Um, here's the Robinson uh, or the universal machine on the left. And what that looks like, it loads from the top. It has all these weights right here that you see. And there's three wheels. The wheels have to pass through the grout joints um, or the path of the wheel has to be within grout joints themselves. And then we're measuring to see once it starts breaking what, what happened. So let me give a better example. This is what the service rating looks like in the TCNA handbook. We've got from light residential, from I'm sorry, from residential to light construction, to moderate, to heavy construction, to extra heavy. Some of the different areas, extra heavy as an example, shows quarry tile, packing houses, breweries, kitchens, commercial kitchens, uh, food plants, etc. And then, of course, like commercials, office space, reception areas, you know, more, yeah, much, much less use. Um, bathrooms, as an example. Heavy use, shopping malls, commercial kitchens, and so on, work areas. So, as I said, every assembly is tested the same. And once the assembly, once a Robinson pad has been assembled, think about, again, that five millimeter, five millimeter recycled rubber versus the thin set direct to the concrete slab, it goes through this rotation. So it starts putting weight on all three wheels. It starts off with the first cycle goes 900 times. There's 900 revolutions with 100 pounds over each wheel with a soft rubber wheel. Next, it goes to 200 pounds over each wheel. 900 cycles again, 300 pounds. 900 cycles again, 300 pounds, 900 cycles again. If it successfully passes all of those rotations or 3,600 uh, rotations with the soft rubber wheels, it gets changed out to hard rubber wheels. And I mean very hard. And you start again, 900 cycles, 100 pounds on each wheel. Then it goes to 200 pounds on each wheel, 900 cycles, 300 and 300, 900 cycles in each of those. If it passes all of that, which is again, uh, would be 
passing on eight. And if you look over here, like commercial is only a one through eight. Sorry, that's one through six. Um, one through 10, so it'd be a moderate. Um, and then you change it out again to a steel wheel. Really very, very demanding. Uh, that starts off with 50 pounds per wheel, 450 rotations. 100 pounds per wheel, 450 rotations. 150 pounds per wheel, 450 rotations. 200 pounds per wheel, 450 rotations. 250 pounds per wheel, 450 rotations. And number 14, 14 cycles, 300 pounds per wheel, 450 rotations. So we just did a test. I got a call yesterday that we uh, used our uncoupling membrane with uh, a, a gauge portion tile and we got up to extra heavy. So um, that means it passed all 14 rotations. While it may not be suitable for commercial construction, in other words, gauge portion tile standard doesn't allow for steel wheels in commercial construction, um, but it would pass extra heavy, all 14 cycles, all 12 cycles, all 10, all six and all three cycles. So it gives you an idea. They have to complete the cycle, by the way. It's not if it broke in the third cycle. That would not get a rating. Hope that makes a little bit more sense. So it's a very, very demanding test. I mean, it really beats a flooring assembly apart. And of course, if a grout joint cracks, if a tile cracks, um, you stop the test. You stop the rotation and they measure it and they check it right then. They say it's it failed at cycle number seven, as an example. And that's recorded and that's how we, we do the reporting. Heavily, heavily, heavily used in the tile industry. Basically, whenever I come out with a new membrane or anything like that, we are definitely doing Robinson testing. I may also use it for unconventional ways. I may use it to see if I put together a fast setting thin set, an accelerated grout, um, how fast I can, I believe I can put traffic on it. Can I do it after 24 hours cure? And I start taking it through the Robinson, I find out it failed at residential. Well, that's not going to work in an airport type environment, is it? So I, I, we do use it for some unconventional type testing, but it's the only way I know how to really judge how much assembly, if you might, can take abuse. Hope that makes sense. And this is really environmental exposure classifications. This originally started out as a committee for backer boards, um, you know, for your foam boards, your, your gypsum based ones, white core gypsum based with acrylic coatings on the top, cementitious boards and so on. But the industry quickly realized we really had something better for it here. And, and what I mean by that is we could rate methods or installations for how much they abuse they can take weather wise. So if you look at a method and it's, I'm going to go back again to that other method. I apologize for this, but I think it'll help. And you look here, it says it's suitable for one, two, three, and five residential and the same one, two, three, and five for commercial. Oh, shoot. There we go. So, an example of that might be that thin set direct to concrete is good for residential dry or commercial dry, residential limited water exposure, and there's better definition than that in the handbook itself, residential wet. So, you know, a, a, a steam room for that matter, something like that. Um, high humidity, heavy moisture exposure. I'm sorry, that's a steam room and it's not rated for that. Uh, in R5 or in, in C5, uh, commercial high temperature. So you're looking at 125 degrees Fahrenheit or greater. And of course, then we've got exterior installation. Then we've got submerged ones, pools, um, water features, spas, fountains, things like that. So that those are an inch rating as well, or each method. Movement joints. I talk about this really quick because I think it's important that you understand some of the evolution of the movement joints as well as, um, you know, some of the important points of it. Movement joints are required. I mean, as I said earlier, tiles as small and as dry as it'll ever be when it comes out of a kiln. And then as it takes on moisture and or it could be uh, temperature related as well, it wants to expand. So, um, movement joints within the structure itself, of course, those need to be carried through. 
If you got a movement joint or expansion joint in a concrete block wall, yeah, you want to carry that through. You don't want to tile over that. Um, if you've got one in the concrete slab, yes, that should be carried through. So one of the important notes in the EJ-171 is it says, because of limitless conditions and structural systems on which tile can be installed, the architect or designer shall so show specific locations and details of movement joints on project drawings. So really an architect or designer should be placing these movement joints so the tile, con tile contractor knows exactly where to go with it. So back previous to 2011, for interior requirements for movement joints, it was every 24 to 36 feet. So it had a range. For interior in 2011, that was changed to 20 to 25 feet. And the idea behind that was we were trying to get more in alignment with what the concrete industry recommended for control joints and, and, and movement joints and so on. Um, then the, there was a change a few years ago. Uh, not, let me do, there we go. Um, we got rid of the 20 and, and just say every 25 feet. Um, exterior requirements, as you see, they've changed a little bit, but really they stayed the same. Interior areas exposed to direct moisture, like a, a, a pool area, if you might, uh, or direct sunlight, heavy sp sunlight, uh, could be a lot of skylights and so on. Again, tiles gonna move, expand and contract by moisture as well as thermal. Um, the, you'll see the joint recommendations are much tighter than what you typically see up here. Above ground concrete slab substrate, same thing, much tighter than what you see here. Again, that's why you saw the A in the uh, F113A earlier for above grade substrates. This requirement for movement joints versus that one. And today, uh, 2021, really, it, no changes. So it still remains the same as what was passed in 2017. But movement joints are essential. I mean, I will assure you, I unfortunately um, see a lot of failures based on this. Everything from water lines in a pool to uh, commercial malls to uh, residences. I, I'm in Florida. So in Florida, tile house to, for, a, for a whole house is very common. And unfortunately, uh, many failures within these houses full of tile are common because of lack of movement joints. Um, they just start popping. So it is important to accommodate it, you know, have a properly placed soft joint or uh, sealant over a backer rod is the proper way to do that. All right, let's talk a little bit about ANSI. And this is the most current ANSI handbook that you see on the left. ANSI is the requirement for installation of ceramic tile as well as test methods for the products and materials themselves. So ANSI is revised every five years. Again, in this digital world today, we can pass something a couple times a year now. Um, and, and when enough is done, it justifies republication and, and that happens. Um, as I said earlier, it, it, it works with the TCNA handbook. It includes specifications on the installation. It includes environmental conditions for where, what should be going on in that installation temperature wise and the amount of coverage required for, for instance, a setting material between a tile and a substrate. Some of the different ANSI standards are installation, when A108, there is material installations, 118, A118 and A136. A137-1, the specifications for ceramic tile. A137-2, specification for glass tile. A137-3, the uh, specification for gauge porcelain tile and gauge porcelain tile panel slash slabs. There is also a 118, oh, I'm sorry, I guess I don't have to get into that. But what you see here is a uh, 118.19 and 118.20 uh, installation standard for gauge porcelain tile. 118.20 just passed this last year. So important, important update to our standards. And uh, 137.1, 138.1, I apologize, uh, for sustainability of setting materials as well as set, uh, ceramic tile itself. As I mentioned just a second ago, is in 2020, um, for gauge porcelain tile, we already had the A137-3 for the manufacturing of ceramic tile and the test requirements for that. And the interior installation of gauge porcelain tile, gauge porcelain tile panel slash slabs, 
in the thin set method, we now have A10820, the ANSI specification for exterior installation of vertical and overhead gauge porcelain tile. So we now have an ex exterior recommendation for gauge porcelain tile. Very important, excellent standard. All right, mortar designations. Back in 2012, we made some changes to ANSI and, and, and the, it started off with an update or it shouldn't really not an update, a new uh, method. And that was, we came out with ANSI 118.15, improved modified dry set mortar. At the same time, we updated 118.15 for improved, a, a category we had not had in the past. Um, we brought about new mortar designations. I'll show you what that means in a minute. How those products currently fit into ANSI, 118.1, dry set mortar, non-modified. 118.4, modified dry set mortar. 118.11, EGP, latex Portland cement mortar. One thing that's important to understand about EGP, EGP is an extension of 118.4. In other words, in here is testing for bonding direct to, to exterior glue plywood that all it, before it gets tested for bonding to exterior glue plywood, it must pass all of 118.4. This is how we did it back then was create a new standard. I think you'll see with, with mortar designations, it makes a little bit more sense. 118.15, improved modified dry set ceram, uh, cement mortar. And I'll show you some of the characteristics of that new, new mortar, which I think is excellent. And people should be well aware of. So higher performing mortars really require their own specifications. So we had 118.4, which is a modified dry set mortar. Kind of became the standard, if you might, for modified mortars, what we used to call latex Portland cement based mortars. ANSI 118.15 is a substantially better mortar than what we used to have in 118.15. Um, excuse me. <coughs> uh, it established a, a high performance mortar, which we had not had in the past. It has much higher shear and bond strengths. It had, it's subject to a new test called heat aging uh, shear bond test. And I'll show you what some of those are. So heat aging shear bond test, take two by two porcelain tile, bond them together face to face with an eighth of an inch offset. They're bonded with thin set mortar. The specimens are cured at room temperature or 70 to 77 for 14 days and then followed by 14 days in an oven at 158 degrees or 70 degrees Celsius. So it's hot, 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 hot for 14 continuous days. After all that, or these 28 days of testing, those same samples have to still pass a shear bond test and remain greater than 400 PSI. That is phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. And I'll show you by a chart what that means. So the interesting thing about this, because you've got to pass such a high test, and you go through these massive thermal changes, um, you can't just pass this by having more cement, more cement, making it a lot stronger. It has to actually have a very high quality polymer as well to actually pass the test. Areas where you might consider 118.15 mortar might be a freeze thaw area where you're concerned about that, maybe the Midwest, um, where flexibility is required. Maybe you're on a lobby of an elevator on 14th floor, floor of a building downtown. Improved bond strength is believed to be necessary. Improved shear strength is positive. Where improved thermal resistance is needed. I'll tell you that almost every exterior deck in the US requires uh, improved thermal resistance, no doubt about it. From going from the sun during the day to the coolness at night. Um, in Florida down here, we could have a deck in the 100 degree range, especially if it's a darker tile, and then get poured on for half hour, 45 minutes and bring that temperature down very rapidly. Where heat resistance is important as well. Exterior decks, as I mentioned, above grade areas where you might anticipate deflection. And the installation of large format tiles where you might really anticipate having a lot of expansion contraction. So this gives you a good example of the different test methods, ANSI 118.1, 118.4, and 118.15. Um, these are new to 118.15, 
and that's the 28 day heat aging I just explained to you. As I said, it's not never been tested before in 118.1 or 118.4, but it must exceed greater than 450 PSI with wall tile. The heat aging with porcelain tile must be greater than 400 PSI after 28 days of heat aging. But in general, you'll see these strengths are quite a bit higher. In the case of wall tile, um, it goes from 200 PSI in uh, seven days with 118.1 to 300 PSI with 118.4 to 450, greater than 450 PSI in 118.15. Better example, let's pick porcelain because um, I think that's one that's more common. Uh, after 28 days, the shear bond tile to tile for 118.1 requires 150 PSI. For 118.4, 200 PSI. For 118.15, 400 PSI. So you can see it's quite a bit stronger, quite a bit. Very, very impressive. It's a very good mortar for difficult installations. All right. Now, coming back to mortar designation. Sorry, that took a while, but I wanted to explain 118.15 before I got here. So now we have a variety of different designations similar to what they have in ISO. So we have a, a designation for E for extended open time, F for fast setting mortars, H for large and heavy tile mortars, or what we just introduced as medium bed mortars in the beginning of the presentation. And this is our newest designation, by the way. And T for non-SAG. So it is feasible to have a 118.4 H or it could have one that has multiple different attributes. So um, again, as I mentioned, you might have an installation interior gauge porcelain tile. Uh, it's a one meter by one meter. It's going up on um, gypsum in a lobby. So one thing that's really important when it comes to gauge porcelain tile is you're notching thin set out on the back of the tile, the lowest absorption substrate, and the substrate itself. So in this case, gypsum. By the way, if, uh, if it's an exposed gypsum, it should have a primer on it. If it's just a paperback gypsum, it should be fine. Um, but you would notch out the mortar on that as well. So we wanna make sure once that's notched out and exposed to the air for a while, it's got adequate open time. So you would definitely be looking for a little bit of extended open time when you're doing a gauge porcelain tile with a gypsum substrate. In addition to that, you probably want non-sag, something that big, you don't want sliding. So you could have, you want to look for a product that has designation at a minimum of 118.4 TE. Could be 118.15 TE. Um, and what happened to 118.11? Why are we not mentioning it with these other ones? Well, because it's an extension of 118.4. So at this point, we don't need to. And there's consideration within committees to eventually eliminate 118.11 EGP and make EGP, a designation of just like these other ones are. So there's an active movement for that right now, which I'm involved in. What's the benefit of having mortar designations? Well, you're picking up a product that you know is specific to the type of installation that you're trying to achieve. I mentioned the gauge porcelain tile already, but I think that's a great example. Maybe that's not the installation that you need. You've got something that you've got a major traffic area in a commercial project that People are walking through constantly, and you're going to have to cut off from the trades for a while. Well, maybe you want to have a fast setting mortar. So to call out for 118.4F for fast setting could be very, very helpful, at least in the pathway areas. Um, it's easy to compare products with competitors. Better, easier way to do it. Again, you get better product selection. You can be confident the products specified are specific for the project use. Why would an architect use them? Well, again, making the mortar specific to the performance he's looking for to get out of the tile assembly in a specific installation. Or to generate reference standards based on high performance. Um, you know, if they're to call out things just by nothing more than 118.4, etc., then they can get a, a, a mortar, if you might, pretty specific to what they're looking for by narrowing down the mortar designations, as opposed to listing out manufacturers like ourselves and a couple of competitors. The owner knows that if it's done this way, that they can have a lot more confidence that the, the tile assembly has really been put together specific for his building and to be able to offer a better warranty system. Um, a while ago, there's also some changes to uh, ANSI A108.02 in grout joint size. And that basically says that if the tile is not square, 
if it's a 16th of an inch out of facial dimension or whatever that dimension might be, that the grout joint could be opened up to three times that size. I point this out because it's an important change. Um, for tile having a variation of a 16th of an inch in facial dimensions, being 16th of an inch out of square, the grout joints have to be 3 16 right? You can't keep it tight and have out of square. It, it, it straight out does not work, even if you center off the center of the room. So in addition to that, there was, this was clarified a few years ago. In no circumstances shall a grout joint be less than 1 16th of an inch. These are within the uh, ANSI standards, and it's listed in the TCNA handbook as well under that field area up front. Tile ranges. This is what's in the ANSI for porcelain tile. You've got two different types of qualities, calibrated and the amount of range for calibration as well as warpage within that tile and rectified. So where the edges are cut square. So you see it's much tighter, it's half of it. Um, and dimensional warpage, same thing, much tighter. All right, kind of wrapping up. Um, the TCNA handbook is not a specification. It's only a reference. It's a quick reference to see how the assembly comes together. Um, a way of simplifying it, if you might, what a method might look like. Uh, in addition to referencing methods, really the specifiers should be used in ANSI to specify tiles and installation methods and materials as well. Um, the ANSI standards as well as TCNA constantly change. So it's important to keep your reference standards updated. If you're not sure how, to, if they're updated or not, reach out to a, a, a manufacturer. I'm sure they'll be glad to update your standards for you. Um, and tile's the least expensive finish you're ever gonna put in a building, depending on the quality of the installation and the method that it's installed in. So I really think it's important to have these uh, different types of, of methods and for them to be specified properly for ANSI as well as TCNA to be referenced. And of course, they be followed thoroughly in the field. They are our best practices. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. <clears throat> so Thank you, Trish. One of the questions that popped up and what we want to ask you is, do you feel that it's important to use the TCNA handbook and ANSI together and not always separately? Yeah, that, that, that's a great question because I think a lot of times, uh, especially tile contractors, have a TCNA handbook because of the methods, but don't have an ANSI to reference. And, and I think, yes, I think they're critical together. Uh, TCNA references ANSI, and uh, ANSI doesn't really reference back to TCNA, but, but they don't really need to because that's an extension of TCNA. So, yes, in my opinion, my honest opinion, you should definitely have both handbooks, and they should both be current because you don't know what the design professional or the owner might be looking for. Uh, the best way to do that is by, by reference or show them. So great question. I, yeah, I definitely believe in, in using them together. Great, thank you. Um, and we had another question. What is the difference between ANSI T rating and ISO T rating? The test methods themselves, I couldn't get into the specifics because I'm not a, 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 a a tester. I mean, I don't really, I'm not a chemist. I don't work in a lab, um, but I believe I'm 99% sure they're pretty, they're pretty close. I mean, extremely close. Uh, that's kind of where they, they, when we first started talking about extending into more to designations, they pulled all the references from the ISO. I can assure you of that. So but I'm sure there might be some small changes, but 99% of it's exactly the same. Great. Thank you. And um, if that helped explain the answer, or we can get more information from you, feel free to email me because we are running a little bit out of time here. So if anyone has any additional questions, feel free to email me. Um, I will get them over to Jim and we'll get them answered for you. But if there are not um, any more questions right now, then um, we're going to head back to um, the networking area for everyone to do, um, for everyone to talk. Sorry, couldn't get that out today. Um, there will be a short survey after the webinar presentation shared in the announcement. So keep your eye out for that um, or the email that we'll send tomorrow with the recording of this webinar. So we can have you um, share or watch this again if for any knowledge. Um, when You'll now have the opportunity to continue networking until 1215 when the event ends. Um, when this presentation stops, you'll be back at a table viewing the floor plan of the event. You can then move from table to table by double clicking on the table you'd like to join.
And you'll be able to see who's at those tables by hovering your mouse over the person's image or the first letter of their name if you haven't uploaded an image. When you're at a table, it's similar to being in a Zoom meeting where other attendees are there, so be sure to turn on your camera and your microphone. You'll also be able to ch chat in the chat feature, so be able um, so be sure to let us know if you have any questions or need any help. We'll be there to help you. Thank you again for attending and have a great week.